Welcome to Into the Void, a Black Sabbath podcast. I'm your host, John, and I'm here with my co-host, Darren. And on today's episode, we are going to be discussing the Dio Band's sixth studio album, Strange Highways. Released on October 25th, 1993, the album would follow the sudden departure of Ronnie and Vinny from Black Sabbath following the Dehumanizer tour. Please see our Dehumanizer episode for a more in-depth discussion on that acrimonious split. Vinny and Ronnie would put together the, put the Dio band back together with Jeff Pilson of Doc and Fame on bass and Tracy G on guitar. Produced by Mike Frazier, who had produced the massively successful Razor's Edge album for ACDC, the album would find Ronnie and the band going in a dark and aggressive direction. Many felt it being a continuation of sorts from where Dehumanizer had left off. Ronnie would lay down some of his most aggressive vocals to date, and the unique sound and style of Tracy, Tracy G would add a fresh modern element to the band's riffs and sound. Although metal was taking a hit at this time from the now peaking grunge movement, the album did mildly respectable sales numbers and had a fairly successful world tour. Okay, Darren, Strange Highways, what are your memories and thoughts on this album? Um, well, i surprised to see it. It was only a year after Dehumanizer came out. And again, like we, we talked about in previous episodes, there wasn't a lot of, we didn't have the benefit of the information highway. So uh, most of the info that I would get would either be from magazines or maybe from listening to shows like Rockline or something like that. Great uh, FM syndicated formats and things like that but we didn't i didn't have the internet in 93 some people did but i i was <laughs> i was late i guess uh but i remember walking into a store and and again similar s scenario to dehumanizer sorry, i saw strange highway so i picked it up and i listened to it and immediately i was sort of stunned it, it wasn't what i expected at all and i think what i expected was it to go back to previous sounding Dio music, you know, to Dio for Dio to basically pick up where he left off in his solo band. But what it what it did was it actually sort of continued the dehumanizer vibe. And I wasn't really prepared for that. It kind of it kind of shocked me a little bit. Add in the fact that there was a, a very cold aspect to it. Really couldn't wrap my head around it. I really couldn't embrace it. It the first song uh, when it, when it, when it kicked off, I noticed there was a difference in this guitar player. It was it, it, at the time it seemed kind of modern to me. He had a lot of effects in his sound. Um, yeah, and that was a little bit off putting initially because I expected to hear somebody like Craig Goldie, somebody from a more traditional uh, school of thought not somebody who was a little bit more modern for the time. So um, that coupled with the fact that the music itself was more sparse and cold, I didn't dislike it, but I had to put it aside. And I didn't really pick it up again for, for... I would check in occasionally and, and see if I liked it. And, and my attitude was pretty much the same for a long period of time. Like, it's okay. Um, but there was nothing about it that really I could really connect with at the time that would come later. Um, but initially it was difficult for me to really embrace. I did like the first song. I thought coming right out of the gate, um, it was cool. I right away. I, I noticed that it was similar in Stylistically, you could say to Dehumanizer, there was more of an aggressive sound of Dio's voice. The lyrics were similar to the type of thing that he was singing about in Dehumanizer. So I could appreciate that, but there weren't, you know, there was no no Tony Iommi. I didn't get those those Tony Iommi riffs. Um, in fact, it was moving from that song to the end of i had it on cassette when i first got it so moving from that song to the end of the tape it was sort of like i was hard pressed to find a really cool sabbathy type of riff i mean there was slow there was plotting 
there was cold, there was, you know, this dark brooding, almost menacing at times quality about it. But I didn't get that like um, Iomi-ish rip type of thing, which I was expecting to hear because there was other reasons why that would be more at home in this situation uh, because it did have that Sabbathy dehumanizer quality. And that was why I think I was maybe expecting a little bit more of that Iomi-ish type of thing. Now, I wouldn't normally expect an Iomi-ish type of thing from anything that Dio had done before, but we were off, we were away from that. And that was very evident from the beginning that we are not, this is not dream evil. This is not, uh, well, it was, I, I, I didn't really care for Lock of the Wolves. So I wasn't even expecting to hear something similar to that. I thought that Dio would go back to his classic traditional sound. And of course, that's not here. Um, so, like I said, I, I did dislike it, but I wasn't really drawn to it. It wasn't something that I, I took to for for quite some time. Uh, now I like it a lot. I, I It's one of my favorite Dio solo albums. Um, but like a lot of other things, sometimes my favorite albums are ones that I don't initially appreciate the way that I will after I've had more time to process it and let it sink in and, you know, kind of grow with it a little bit. Um, that's where Strange Highways is for me. And um, I think that's pretty cool. I, I, I think that um, in some ways it's allowed it to to age better for me i can still put it on and it, and, and i i really enjoy listening to it and it doesn't feel dated I, I still enjoy the earlier dio stuff but some of it feels a little bit dated in the production quality and some in some of the albums sometimes the guitar playing is a little bit dated this one uh even though it does have you know straight tracy g does have a really unique effect style uh it doesn't to me sound dated because I, I don't really, I don't really put what he's doing necessarily to a particular point in time. It's just unique. It's his own sound. I, you know, it, it is what it is. It, it, the whole album doesn't sound to me necessarily like a product of the nineties. It just sounds like it's its own thing that exists on its own plane, <laughs> its own little world. I mean, that's what I find so cool about it. So that's pretty much where I am with Strange Highways. How about you? I did not get this album when it came out. This was, and I've talked about this in the previous podcasts, I had some what I call my years away from metal, basically like about 89, 1990. It was about 94, 95 when I started getting back into metal i was still listening to music of course but i was listening to the seattle stuff and i had drifted away from traditional metal so i did not get this album till after i had gotten angry machines i got angry machines and i but when angry machines came out i was really starting to get back into classic you know the bands i grew up on say and so i got angry machines really liked angry machines and then went and got strange highways like you mentioned this is before the internet i was living in a house without a television <laughs> no i i was completely out of touch with the world so I, it wasn't until i started actively like i got angry machines and then i sort of went backwards like oh here's this other album that i missed that i missed out on <clears throat> so I was already exposed to this lineup of the band from Angry Machines, but uh, I liked this band in this sound right away because having coming out of this phase in my life, I think the reason why I drifted away from metal was it, it by 89, 90, it was starting to really sound stale to me. As I like to say, all my favorite bands weren't putting out my favorite albums from them. Maiden was sounding stale to me. Lock Up the Wolves felt kind of stale to me. It, so when I heard this band, Tracy G on Angry Machines, and then quickly going and getting on a Strange Highways, 
it felt modern to me. And a lot of that had to do with Tracy G's sound and his playing. You have to sort of put yourself in the context of the mid 90s, where the era of the shredding guitar guy playing neoclassical licks or playing blues type licks, it, it just wasn't happening at that time. And so Tracy's sound and his style, it seemed appropriate to me at the time. It reminded me in some ways of like Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine, who was a guy who sort of turned the guitar on its head, so to speak. He rethunk how you play the guitar. He was yeah. not a traditional sounding guitar player. He dealt a lot with sounds and and kind of noises and, and unique techniques at this time also i also remember i should have looked this up when that black sabbath nativity in black tribute album came out i think was somewhere around the mid 90s i i just remember there being like uh the industrial metal thing was also sort of happening at the time bands like ministry and and stuff like that. And I was kind of aware of those bands and they had very kind of cold robotic guitar sounds. And if there was a guitar solo, it was in a very untraditional way. I was also listening to Primus, for instance, there's another example of guitar in a very sort of unorthodox way. You're not hearing these type of eighties guitar cliches that you, that you got in the 80s you know people were exploring and doing different things with the guitar so when i heard tracy, tracy g's playing i loved it and it was really exciting and it was kind of what i needed at that time i think if i had listened to angry machines and then gotten strange highways and it was some guy that was kind of like a stock 80s sounding yeah. bluesy fast tapping guy or something some guy stuck in the LA or eighties style of guitar playing. I, I don't, I, it, I don't know if I would, I wouldn't have gotten into it. I, it, for me getting back into metal, I needed to hear something that, that felt modern. It felt like it sort of fit, but that still had some touchstones to classic stuff. Like Ronnie is still singing here. He's not growling or screaming or anything like that. Uh, so you still have the traditional elements of a classic metal here, but it was really Tracy's guitar. It's kind of like what Zach did a little bit for, for Ozzy. Zach sort of brought, we talked about this with No More Tears, how Zach tuned down and he had some more modern guitar style techniques and he sort of brought Ozzy's sound, made it to sound like what was happening at the time, you know, another band to reference might be Pantera, you know, uh, uh, Dimes guitar sound was kind of unique. So Tracy did this for me, the way he had used his sound was uh, not industrial in the sense of industrial music, but it had a, had a feeling to me of like, it was kind of cold and slightly robotic sounding, but I liked it. And he had a lot of like, squeals and noises that he did with his guitar and his guitar solos were not traditional sounding type of guitar solos they were real kind of angular and like kind of weird licks and stuff like that jumping all over the neck and everything the riffs themselves had this sort of twisted feel to them they were down tuned they were real kind of uh, harsh sounding at times and I loved it and I thought it was great. And you mentioned it sort of feeling like it picked up from where dehumanize, you know, relating it to dehumanizer. And it felt like it took dehumanizer, which was kind of a slightly modern, cold sounding record. And it sounded like it took it to an even another level, another step. It sounded even more colder and more robotic. I, when I think of this era of the band, I always think of the cover of Angry Machines because, again, I got Angry Machines before Strange Highways and the robots on the cover of Angry Machines. That's what this band has that kind of like cyborg robots attacking. Vinny's drums are real like menacing and pounding and slightly gated and 
just the whole sound of this era of the band and and I loved it and as I revisit this album which I do very often because I in some ways this is this and angry machines are the last two Dio albums that I really really love uh I just I I find think very I find things to discover on these records I think there's a lot of cool stuff going on I think they've aged very well like you've mentioned there are albums that I can come back to and uh, even though I associated i associate these albums with me getting back into metal so they remind me of where i was at that time in my life and just starting to get excited about metal again and uh yeah so i have really good memories of this record this lineup of the band of just this 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 whole era it's kind of an ex a very exciting time for me which is kind of funny because they're for a, for a lot of people they don't have that same feeling of this era of the band. This was the checkout point for some people with this era of the band. But for me, it was me getting back into the band. This is what got me back into Dio and just even metal in general. This basically Angry Machines, Strange Highways and uh, Bruce Dickinson's Balls to Picasso were the three albums that me made me start going back and checking out, hey, I wonder what Iron Maiden's doing. I wonder what Dio's been up to and... I never left Black Sabbath, but you know these these albums just Dehumanizer two started getting me back interested in in metal again. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I really liked Dehumanizer. I was really really excited about that album when it came out, and I was disappointed that things didn't move forward with that lineup. And um, when I heard this, like I said, it, it reminded me of Dehumanizer, so I was I was happy about that, but. I, again, it wasn't it wasn't Tony Iommi, and it was it was Tracy G. And you made a good comparison, and I didn't. I, it, it never <laughs> dawned on me until you said it. But you compared him to Tom Morello in in as so far as taking the instrument and doing something unique with it, and that's a really good comparison because even though they don't sound alike, the the things that Tracy G is doing are are definitely outside the box and definitely different from what Vivian Campbell and Craig Goldie and uh, what's the other guy's name? Uh, Rowan Robertson. Robertson. What was his first name again? Rowan. Rowan. That's right. Um, Tracy G was doing his own thing. He was bringing his own style to the band, and um, in much the same way that. Tom Morello was doing his thing. It was just ex experimenting with the instrument, getting different sounds, and and making a unique statement with his um, contribution to the Dio band. And uh, when we um, when this episode was, when we were getting ready to do it, and it was time to start thinking about Strange Highways. Uh, I, I really couldn't find very much on the internet, or uh, Dio's book doesn't doesn't go into this era and so it was hard for me to to find a lot of information on tracy g and where he came from and, and with the background and the history of the band and the the historical context of where where dio was and and how this band came together but um i did have a friend who worked with tracy g and one of tracy g's post dio solo endeavors and um my friend elvin rodriguez who's also in a band spillage um plugging spillage spillage is a great band from chicago um for obviously people who are listening to this and are fans of black sabbath you should check out spillage very uh traditional sabbath -y. in fact they even do a pretty killer cover of dirty women on their second album i believe it's their second album blood of blood of angels but anyway elvin hooked me up uh with tracy g and uh, I had the opportunity to just go right to the source um, and ask Tracy G, how did the band come together? You know, where did you come from? And and what was what, what was the writing situation like? How was the studio experience? And all these questions. Um, so I rattled off uh, a few questions to him. And um, so Tracy G came to the Dio fold by way of band world war three which also featured vinnie apice and jimmy bain and when dio got back with vinnie 
Vinny had asked Tracy to audition and Tracy did and he got the gig. And so at this point, the beginning stages of Strange Highways, we had Vinny, Tracy G and Jimmy Bain. Jimmy Bain lasted for about two weeks and um, then they brought in Jeff Pilsen and from formerly a, a doc and fame. I mean, that's where I know Jeff Pilsen from. I don't know where else Jeff Pilsen. What other bands Jeff Pilsen would in, was in, but he was in Dokken, which was interesting because Dokken's not a band that I would consider heavy. I mean, you could say they're metal, but not in the way that this album is metal. So when I saw that Doc, Jeff Pilsen was was part of the band, I was kind of taken back by that. But anyway, as, as, as Tracy explained, um, Jimmy Bain was initially in the band. It lasted about two weeks, and he had a disagreement with Ronnie, I believe, and then he left, and then Jeff Pilsen came in, and Jeff Pilsen continued to write with the band. Um, and so uh, that that's how that came about, and that's how, how Tracy G entered into this, is with the World War III band. Um, but they, they apparently um, got along well enough to be able to, to jam, riff, put some things together. Um, Ronnie would be in the room. He'd listen to it. When he heard something he'd liked, he'd say, whoa, 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 play that again. And they would work on that, work on that part that maybe that rip or that progression or whatever it was that Ronnie had an interest in. And they would work on that as the song. So the whole thing came together pretty organically. And as you listen to the album, you, you can hear, I think, a bit of that, that organic, you know, playing off the, the musicians, playing off one another. There is a sparse quality to most of the song. There is a consistently slower to mid tempo type of thing going on from song to song. But you can hear that the instruments seem to be feeding off of one another. And um, and that's that's really cool because it, it does give it that almost a live sound and that was how tracy expressed the way that things were written for this album and then they would record things uh dia would take the recorder home with him he'd work on some melodies he'd come back the next day and he'd have some things to play for the other guys and tracy said most of the time it was awesome so then then would pretty much get the song rolling along um so, you know, when, when you're talking about this album and where these guys were at this time, I, I think that the way that things were progressing, things, the way that things were coming together also kind of helped shape this, the way that this album sounds. It was like almost kind of back to the drawing board, back to square one. You know, we had talked about in our Holy Diver episode where, you know, Dio was out of Sabbath. And now he's starting a solo band. It's kind of almost the same scenario. Um, at the time of Holy Diver, he was jamming with uh, with Vinny, who followed him out of Sabbath and hooked up with, with Jimmy. And it's kind of the same scenario here. Hooked up with Vinny again, playing with Jimmy. Got a new guitar player, but this time instead of Vivian Campbell, it's Tracy G. So I, I think this album does have a stop-start kind of element to it which uh even though it doesn't sound like holy diver it does kind of have that that aspect to it and it's almost like a starting point and, and i think that's that's a pretty cool thing about this record and when people try to say well it doesn't sound like dio or this isn't the dio band that i like it's understandable because it is a different animal it was a a new beginning of this and and I, when we make the comparison between this album and Dehumanizer, then we're talking about the lyrical, the subject matter, the overall vibe that is brought in from Dehumanizer, from from Dio's mindset while he was working on on Dehumanizer, and it plays really nicely into this this format. Uh, of how these guys are working together and how the songs are coming along. And you can see that Dio, if, 
is every bit as angry <laughs> as he was. Maybe he wasn't quite as angry. Maybe, maybe I, I think we, we, when we talked about the humanizer, we, we thought of it as more of like it's an observational reality type of thing. On strange highways, it's less of an overall observation and more of a Dio bringing in that experience, that that anger from the way things ended with Sabbath and bringing that into what he's currently doing. And there's a couple songs and when we go from song to song. One in particular, I noticed that I, I think Dio is really bringing that into the lyrical uh, in the concept of, of the song. But um, yeah, so I mean, I, I to, to me, this album, in addition to liking the music, in addition to liking um, the direction that, that, that it's going in, I, I also appreciate it from uh, the sin sincerity aspect of it, too. It, it definitely seems like this is an album that has a lot of um emotion there's an emotional content to it and um yeah I, I i really like it so even though lock i agree with everything you said and you mentioned about it feeling like a new beginning and it, and it does and if part of and and you mentioned too that the issue that some people have with this is that it doesn't sound like dio the classic Dio band. And like I mentioned earlier, I think if it had sound it too much like the classic Dio band, it just wouldn't have worked. Not in 1994. Yeah. Uh, it didn't work for me on Lock Up the Wolves. To me, they felt like there was some chemistry here. There was some energy. Tracy, Vinny, even Jeff Pilson, I think he really brings a unique sound to the band. Jimmy Bain yeah. had a very bright kind of played with a guitar, played with a pick when he played bass, very attacking type of sound, whereas Jeff Pilson has this kind of fingery, rubbery uh, bass sound that I think is is really cool. I did want to comment on, when I when I got this album in the 90s, I, I didn't think about this because lyrically, much like Dehumanizer, it felt like it fit in with that, what was happening in that era. Because in this era, again, it's grunge. And if you remember grunge, it was a lot of angst and anger and stuff like that. But as I was revisiting this record, preparing for the podcast, it did really strike me of how angry Ronnie sounds on this album. And it's not like Ronnie doesn't deal with dark subject matter. He, he has throughout his whole career. But the difference here is, is that there was always an uplifting aspect to Ronnie's music, even if the subject matter was kind of dark. Uh, there was always a rainbow in the dark, <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah. Uh, rock and roll children. Yeah, that whole kind of thing of we rock and yeah, things are bad, but rock and roll is going to save the day. Long live rock and roll. And, and that kind of thing. He always felt like he was a person that was more like pointing out the darkness, but here it seems like Ronnie is actually angry himself. And if you do know about the history here, and we talked about this with the dehumanizer podcast of how it ended very badly at the end of the dehumanizer tour with, uh, geezer and tony wanting to do these shows with ozzy for his at the time retirement tour it also reminded me i don't know if you've seen this interview and uh for the pe people out there maybe they've they've seen it if you haven't you can look this up i i i, I should have looked up the title of it beforehand but it's an interview with ronnie on his tour bus and i yeah. believe it's on the angry machines tour yeah. And the interviewer is going, he has all the CDs in his hand and he goes, I think he might even go back to Elf. He literally goes through every album in, in Ronnie's catalog. And Ronnie's very polite, he vittled very gentlemanly with the interviewer, but there's a, you can just sense the, the tension, the anger in yeah. Ronnie as he's going through and talking about these albums. And in fact, at the beginning of the interview, he sort of freaks out and is yelling at somebody on the bus about something. I don't know. Like, it's like right when the, when the tape starts and he's visibly upset and it's kind of strange to see this because you're used to Ronnie being so sort of calm and collected with his thoughts and not being somebody who get, even when he is kind of, 
talking about something more emotional, he's still very kind of reserved and respectful, but here he's just, he just seems angry. And I think yeah. this whole era for him coming out of uh, the way Sabbath ended, I did a little research and looked back at some of the places that he was playing for strange highways and angry machines. And he toured quite extensively all over the world. This wasn't a case like Black Sabbath where he wasn't able to play in the U.S. He was still playing dates in the U.S., but he was playing for strange highways. He was playing rooms that were 1,500 to 2,000 people, and he was doing pretty well. He was selling those rooms. For Angry Machines, he was down to 500 to 1,000 seat rooms. Now, I went back and looked at the Sacred Heart Tour. Sacred Heart Tour, he was playing arenas that were averaging 15 to 20,000 seats. Yeah. So you can imagine the stress of, and I didn't look up Dehumanizer, but I, I'm pretty sure that Dehumanizer was, they were playing in small basketball arenas and stuff like that. So they were yeah. probably doing 15,000, roughly 15,000 seat arenas. So now you've gone from that to playing one to 2,000 seat places. So this is probably weighing on him. And as I listen to this record, you hear, you can hear this in a lot of the lyrics and it's sort of striking how you don't get the, you don't get the uplifting part of Ronnie. No. <laughs> you know, you don't get the, hey, things are bad, but hey, it'll all be okay because rock and roll will save the day or, you know, rainbow and there's a rainbow in the dark. We're all rock and roll children. You know, one night in the city, that 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 kind of thing where everything kind of works out in the end. You, you don't get that here. It's a real sort of... No. Uh, you can sense in the lyrics how, and the lyrics are very pointed at times. And you, if you can almost hear him, some of these lyrics, you could just think that he's singing these to Geezer and Tony and just the business in, in general. And it's in some ways it's, it's, it's interesting, but it's also kind of sad knowing what, knowing and, and, knowing what kind of person that Ronnie was, he was a guy that was very, uh, had a lot of good energy. And if you listen, to, if you read interviews with Wendy Dio, she alludes to this too, that this was a very difficult time for Ronnie. Uh, Strange Highways, Angry Machines. Wendy has said Angry Machines is not her favorite Dio record because she can sense how angry Ronnie was at this, at this time in his career and everything. So, it is kind of interesting as I was listening to it today, I was, I was really kind of sensing that. And in some ways it makes me a little uncomfortable because again, you're used to Ronnie being this, this guy who, uh, you know, there is some, something positive, uplifting coming yeah. from his lyrics. And the album too is very, there's very little levity on this record. There is no walk away or do you close your eyes or just mystery or uh, uh, hungry for heaven. You know, you're not getting really any yeah. of that kind of, which usually on a Dio record, even in with during the Sabbath era, there's usually one or two things that are just, that are just kind of fun slipping away or, you know, whatever, walk away, uh, those kind of things you know, that are just kind of a little bit more lighthearted and, and fun it really isn't any of that on here. So the album can be a little fatiguing, you know, when you listen to it from beginning to end, it's, it's pretty intense. There's not, again, there's not a lot of levity on this record. It's a lot of kind of Ronnie sings in a very aggressive tone throughout this whole record. There's a few moments where he sort of goes into a little bit of a lighter mode in his voice. Uh, but you, you just, you're not getting a lot of that here. And even, even on dehumanizer, again, I think this takes the darkness of dehumanizer and it goes even one step further with it. And whereas on dehumanizer, like you mentioned, it's more directed out at the world here. It seems like it's coming out of Ronnie personally like he's talking about personal feelings rather rather than being observational and looking at the darkness and, the, and being angry at the world here he's he's sort of more angry at the world he's living in his own personal world yeah yeah you're right when when you said there is something almost unsettling about the fact that the guy 
who, when we were teenagers, uh, would always give us that little ray of hope, like, yeah, things are bad, or or I understand what, what you're going through, but you know, we, we still got rock and roll, or there's still a rainbow in the dark, and there's still hope when that guy <laughs> is at this point where he is just angry. It's almost like it it's it's kind of startling. Yeah. And, and, and it hasn't lost any of its effect even over the years. I, I was just listening to it the other night and I'm still kind of like taken back by how angry he, he sounds on this. And it's genuine. It isn't like, oh, I'm going to try to you know, try to be sound an angry to kind yeah. of correspond with the way the music is. No, it, it sounds like it's really sincere. And that's one of the things that I think is so effective about this album. And it isn't one of the things that really hits you right away. I mean, you do notice, you know, the, the tempo and the way that Dio is singing, but I don't know that you notice the anger so much right away. It's something that after you've listened to it for a while and you, you know, you, you come, you, you put a, put it aside for a little while, you come back to it and then you realize, wow, this guy was really angry. And, and this album is really cold, man. It, it has a real cold quality to it. And I love that because it's, it's just a different expression. Um, you're right. There isn't any levity. I mean, there is a little bit, but it's almost in a sardonic kind of way. It, it's yeah. not in like a very feel good sort of way. So it is a very, very cold album. And I think that was one of the things that initially pushed me away from it. You know, people have said, and I've, I've read people talking about their attitude towards this album and not liking it because they had issues with the Tracy G. Um, but I, I'm not sure if that, I, I think that's an easy place to go because that is one of the more significant differences uh, with the way with the sound of this album but i would i would venture to say that it probably is the way that the album is so cold and it has a brutal emotional content to it that i think was what really um the underlying thing that was pushing or maybe was a little off-putting to people and they just sort of attributed it to the way the guitar sounded uh, because that was the most noticeable thing. And when you're trying to like figure out, well, why is it that I can't connect to it? And the guitar, that unique guitar sound that Tracy G has is jumping out at you. Well, that's a really easy place to go. It's, oh, well, it's because of the way that the album sounds. But I think beneath the surface, and I think almost subliminally and psychologically, there was this cold, dark, menacing sounding record that I think was making it difficult for people to really connect with it the way that they were able to connect with the hopeful um more positive i'm in this with you uh, we're all in this together kind of deal thing um we kind of lost that leader and <laughs> we lost him in the darkness where is he where is he oh he's off somewhere else and he's dealing with his own issues and and, and you know it, it it's cool, but in a way, it it is really it kind of puts you in a in a weird place with, with, with your experience of Dio and his music. And because I mean, there's a long tradition. We're talking about you know the Dio with the rainbow and the wizards and the hope and the yeah. rock and roll children and everything. There's a mystery and hungry for heaven. There's a long tradition of that, and it goes back to Rainbow basically in in some in some way. But when so that long tradition has it is now over and it's it's kind of it's perplexing <laughs> it's like wait a minute what happened and to hear that voice that you're so familiar with and being you know a comforting uh voice is now dealing with his own and you want to like <laughs> part of part of me is like oh well i want to i want to say it'll be okay ronnie i'm here <laughs> for you <laughs> yeah but you know that of course that's not that's not the case and um but it is sort of like a little bit it's um jarring to hear ronnie like this but man it makes for a great album it, you know yeah. i wouldn't have it any other way you know, it's unfortunate that I'm sure he was struggling with things and it could have been, you know, a product of the times. So it's like you said, you know, the the crowds were were becoming fewer, you know, going from arenas to what, what did you say? Basketball 
stadiums well, or something. By the time the here, he's board. playing 2,000, one of the 2,000 seat places. So that's basically like a large club. Like a, like, right. So he's playing, he's going from arenas to clubs. And I mean, that has to be something that is a hard pill to swallow. So there's that, you know, you have that in the background. And also, I, I'm really familiar with that interview. And I think about that a lot, the one you just mentioned about when he's on the bus and the, and the guy's interviewing him and he has and Ronnie signing the CDs. And, and and what's so cool about that is that that is Ronnie not being a rock star. That is Ronnie just being a normal human being. Yeah. And in talking about, you can just, you can tell how disappointed and angry he is. And he said at one point, it's like, yeah, this could have been the greatest band in the world, but <laughs> these guys blew it. And he's right. You know, uh -huh. I think he continued on either after mob rules or after dehumanizer, I mean, yeah, they'd be a force Where to reckon. They have gone, but, yeah, yeah. So, and and anyway. for me, I can't picture any. This is why Tracy G works in this band for me. If it was a guy with kind of a seventies blues rock, British blues rock guitar style and sound, playing blues type riffs it, it it just wouldn't have worked it needed this kind of noisy cold sometimes squealy and atonal sounding guitar stuff sounds coming out of nowhere riffs that sound like they're i always think of like and this is perfectly suits Vinny's drumming you know Vinny is is the master of just that simple pounding slow drum beat you know and and tracy's yeah. guitar playing locked in on those weird angular riffs it sounds like some kind of futuristic robotic tank rolling through a winter field or something you know it just has this like very driving cold hard feel to it uh so I can't see it working any other way. It made total sense to me when I heard it at the at the time. And and this is just it's what I wanted to hear. I I didn't want to hear some stale 80s sounding thing. I wanted something that that sounded like it worked because the world had changed. Metal metal had changed by 94, 95. The things, the landscape was totally different. It didn't the whole Going back to 1988, it wasn't working for anybody in 1994, 95. You know what I mean? You either yeah. you either did something to, to to adjust to it, or or it just wasn't happening for you. You know, so I I appreciated the fact that it was different, and I appreciated the fact that Tracy was coming in with this really unique sound. That 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 the band in general just had this this kind of unique uh, unique sound to it. So. Yeah, and it it feels kind of raw and it feels honest, which is which is interesting because again, Ronnie's a guy that he doesn't really. I, I mean, gosh, I'd have to really sit back and think about when I feel like Ronnie is ever singing about himself. You know, he never sings about himself. He's always singing about us and we and wizards and fantasy type type things. And even on Dehumanizer, he's. TV crimes. He's singing about preachers and televangelists and stuff like that. And you know, it doesn't doesn't feel like he's ever necessarily getting really, really personal and spilling his emotions. But it comes out in this record, and I think that's what really makes it makes it work for me. And it does have kind of a live you know, with the, the band. It just feels like there's 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 a chemistry here that's that's really working. So yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it was almost as though Ronnie didn't ever want to burden any of us with his own personal issues. He wanted to be there to provide some support and guidance through his music. But uh, here, I think he was just pretty much at the end of his rope. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> hey, man, this is, what I, this is all I got. You're going to get it. <laughs> and I appreciate that. I, I It shows a really much more human side. I mean, he's not, you know, he's, he's not indestructible, uh, you know. And it was yeah. good to see some vulnerability uh, put through in the music, even though um, it was unfortunate that he was feeling this way. But I think it really adds to a, an overall more interesting album. All right. Shall we jump into the songs? Yep. 
Okay, so the album starts with Jesus, Mary, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, I love this. I think it's a great album opener. I love that sort of crazy noise right at the beginning. Again, I was already familiar with Tracy G's style, but I can understand how if if you came in here on Strange Highways, how right from the beginning, I mean, right from the first sound <laughs> yeah. on the record, it's definitely like, okay, this is this is something different. And the main riff is very kind of twisted and upside down kind of sounding uh, riff. I think it's great uh, that when Ronnie comes in singing, there's like an effect or something on his voice, which makes it sound real menacing. And and I mentioned Jeff Pilson's bass playing already. He has kind of a, a very different sound than Jimmy Bain and the bass is mm -hmm. really punchy and, and clear on this. And, uh, yeah, it, 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 uh, I just think it's really cool. I love the just kind of the starts and stops and the way the guitar is. <laughs> there's like these kind of like sounds and noises from the guitar. And there's that one spot where everything stops and it sounds like heavy breathing or something. Where it's yeah. Like, yeah. You know, and then the guitar goes, yeah. jum, 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 jum. you know, again, it has this very matrix, futuristic, apocalyptic, you know, it's a cyborgs attacking kind of uh, kind of vibe to it. And I think it's just I think it's just I think it's great. I love it. And this was a song that I think they used as their their show opener for yeah. much of this this era from the from the band. I, th I think it's a great album opener. I love it. Absolutely. Great, great album opener. Kicks things off. I, I still I got chills at the time when I first heard it. Uh, I, I still do sometimes. I love it when Dio just opens up during the verse, like the second half of the verse, and he's just wailing and spitting out the lyrics. And you can just tell that he's just all in on it. He's just so much inspiration, so much of himself he's putting into this song. Um, the band sounds great together. They're well integrated. Like you said, Jeff Pilson's bass really sounds good, very like deep and the rumble of his bass and and of course Vinny's drums. Um, but it has a really nice pace to the song, which starts the album off in a really good way. Um, I love the song and it's it's probably my second favorite. It was my 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 number one song off of this album, but I think it's my my second. I think it's my second favorite more recently. But uh, yeah, it's a great way to start the album. Jesus, Mary, and the Holy Ghost. Yeah, I also love the part where when he sings the "Now I lay me down to," you know, he sings in sort of yeah. this lighter voice. But yeah, great yeah, song. Perfect. Probably my second favorite song on the record. Also, okay. Next, we go to Firehead. This is where we were mentioning about how. Yeah, Ronnie is just singing with so much like aggression and venom <clears throat> in his voice. I love the the chorus in this, the way he the way he sings those, uh, you know, the way he sings that uh, feel the heat from firehead. The way he sings that the, the chorus line is just great, and I love that line. Uh, let me see. Uh, from spooky stories that he's read, they put pictures on his body. And the way yeah. Johnny sings that line is just, it's just great. It's it's and again, it's got these sort of crazy guitar squeals in it, and I, I just love the the way he he has so much sort of grit and power in his voice. Feel the heat from Firehead. <laughs> it's just it's so yeah. heavy, man. It's just it's great. Yeah, it's it's a great follow up to the to Jesus Mary and the Holy Ghost. Um, great second second song. Uh, everything you said, I agree with. I love the lyrics, um, the the overall vibe of the song. It is an angry song, so right right here, you know, you're really introducing some Dio's in inner turmoil. It's coming out through the song Firehead. What I really like about this song is Tracy G's lead. I like the way it's phrased. I like what he's yeah. doing. It starts out a little bit, a little shreddy, but then he gets into this point where he he just has a very melodic phrasing uh, going on from probably maybe the second part of the solo to the end. And I really look forward to that. And, and that to me, and I've said it before, that is 
what I look for in a solo, something that I can remember that brings something to the song that I look forward to hearing. I just don't want to hear guitar noise. I want to hear something that that's enhancing the song, making it better, putting a, something in the song that makes me look forward to hearing it. And that solo does that. And that's one of the things I, I really appreciate about this song in particular and makes the song better for me. But overall, it's a great second track. Uh, probably a bit less intense than than how we started off but um you know it's following with with the vibe and it's getting into what will be the the third song so yeah all right so the third song then is the title track strange highways and up to this point even though we've mentioned this a couple times how this feels like a continuation of sorts of uh, dehumanizer I can't picture Iomi playing any of those riffs on the first two songs. They're way too detached and far, too far removed from anything sort of blues based or, or too strange to be something that, uh, that Iomi would play. But here on Strange Highways, this feels very Sabbath like to me because it does have that slow plodding uh, kind of uh, vibe to it. I love the clean guitar vocal intro thing, classic uh classic ronnie i love when he does that uh this is one that i could picture this maybe having been on dehumanizer it's got that kind of after all the dead uh mm -hmm. vibe to it it also has ronnie doing uh one of my favorite things when he sort of alters uh the vocals a little bit towards the end of the song where let's see if i can find the line here every time yeah every time i climbed the mountain and it turned into a hill well i promised me i'd disappear and now i know i will <laughs> that's mm -hmm. that's great and when the way he sings that i think he sings that twice in the song but when he comes back to it kind of at the end of the song and the way the song fades out it reminds me of like sign sign of the southern cross where it's just going out on this really like ominous sort of fading out uh, down this strange highway if you will so yeah this is a great song sabbath vibes on on this one for me slow crushing this is something these a complaint that i have the last couple albums that the do band put out is, is that there's too many slow plotting things and lock up the wolves had this problem too but and it's not that I don't like slow things. And this is the example of it. This is a slow song. This is, but it's so heavy. It's so just crushing. And yeah. it and it and it works because the melodies are great. The riffs are really catchy. It has this really dark kind of ominous uh vibe to it. And again, a lot of that is is Tracy's guitar sounds too. Again, when the soul, I just love when this song is fading out and his he's i don't even know if you'd call it a solo it's more like kind of just sounds like it sounds like he's just yeah. sort of sliding his hand up and down the neck and has it's just these weird noises coming out of the guitar it's just fantastic man i love it yeah yeah this definitely has a very uh <clears throat> sabbath quality to it the churning riff um and this is really effective and in some ways when we talk about the coldness of the album and how it could be a bit off-putting in a way uh, because you're not sure how to how to process this this direction that Dio is going and I think this song probably best exemplifies that that feel starts off melancholy and bluesy a little, little bluesy more melancholy and usually traditionally where Dio will go from there is into kind of a more, um, uh, he'll take it up a notch with the riff. The, the, the riff that'll come in will be something that kind of like gets your blood pumping. Yeah. But man, it's not happening here. It just <laughs> drops. It drops you down. But it's really, really cool. And it has, it really conveys this sincerity from where it starts out and the way that he's singing it and it's melancholy. And then you think, well, okay so what do you would normally do like i just like i like i said he would probably bring it up but man he's just he's he's going from the melancholy and he's continuing in that in that emotional vein but taking it down to an even lower place and it makes sense 
and yeah. it's it's a little unusual for the for the title track to be the third song on the album. But when, but when you don't think of it from that aspect, when you think of it as how these songs are flowing, and you're starting off, it kicks things off with um, Jesus, Mary, and the Holy Ghost goes in a firehead, and you've got a good one-two punch there. Now it's time to get into the feel, get into the concept that they were trying to build on this album. And this song does that so well. So it's a, it's a really, it is a really good place in the sequence for it. But man, I cannot understate the way that this thing just is like, boom, it is like, <laughs> boom, yeah. it's heavy. And um, and wow, I, I had never heard anything like this from Dio before. And done, not only is it, is it a first, basically. I mean, you talk about After All and some of the songs on, on Dehumanizer. Um you know to to me maybe i was was a really aggressive song for dehumanizer and when you're talking about the slower tempo songs from dehumanizer like after all this just blows them away this is just taking that and moving into a direction that's even more convincing darker colder menacing sorrowful it's 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 a really successful song and this is my favorite song on the album yeah this is my favorite song on the album. this is mentioned... the one that i hear over and over in my head after i listen to it this is the one that that kind of haunts me after i yeah. listen to it yeah this, there's funny. there is a real sort of haunting quality to this it, it it you made a good point i didn't think of this that in a typical Ronnie situation, you'd have something like all the fool sailed away where it starts off sort of mellow, but then there's that very triumphant riff, dun, 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 yeah. dun, dun, you know, and all the, that's a typical move that Ronnie would do in the, in the deal band, but you're right here. It's just like, it starts very melancholic and everything. And it's like, all of a sudden you've just been swallowed by the earth. And now yeah. you're like you're yeah. hundreds of miles in the core of the earth here in some dark forbidden a place yeah. or something you're right it just it just sort of drops down and the way it fades out at the end again i just picture like oh man like caverns and lava and you're just somewhere down below the earth here in some strange forbidden planet or something or somewhere it's just oh man the way the song goes out i think it's just absolutely uh absolutely fantastic and i i also love this line and again, this is where I think, you know, maybe some of this stuff is pointed at people who have wronged Ronnie in his life. You know, when he sings this line, so someone give me blessings for the times you say I've sinned so I can crawl inside myself and ride into the wind on strange highways. Great, great line. Yeah, that is a great line. Really creative. Okay, let's move on to the fourth song on the album, which is Hollywood Black. Uh, this one was actually supposed to have been something that was tossed around during the Dehumanizer uh, sessions. I've heard Iomi say he doesn't really know, you know, maybe just some of the lyrics or something like that. He doesn't believe that any of the riffs or anything, but maybe the the title or something was something that was brought up during the Dehumanizer era. Uh cool heavy chugging riff it's got a good catchy chorus uh i like this song but man after coming off of yeah. jesus mary and the holy ghost and strange highways good song but you know it doesn't live up to it doesn't live up to the three that have come before it especially jesus mary and the holy ghost and strange highway so this one is cool but just kind of there compared to the other ones doesn't rise up to the level of what came before it no, we're we're kind of uh we're coming off of strange highways and I and I think it works in the sequence. Um I don't know where you would go from strange highways. There certainly yeah. isn't gonna be anything that's gonna to equal it at this point. So but Hollywood Black is a good song that follows it. It's pretty straightforward, it's pretty direct. Uh, again, uh, it's another really nice solo by by Tracy G, very well phrased. Starts out again a little shreddy, but then moves into a, a more well phrased melodic place and, and I appreciate that. Um, this also has a menacing quality, so it's not taking things in a different direction, but it's kind of moving things in away from strange highways and, and building building things up again to to take you down <laughs> once more. But uh, strange highways drops you down. This song is kind of like 
pulling things up again to you know pulling you up and saying okay we're not done yet get up here's more music <laughs> yeah. uh regarding it, it possibly being a sabbath song that was a holdover from dehumanizer i mean i, I guess i can kind of hear that I, that is one of the things that you do come across on the internet um when this album comes up that uh, you know that the one song hollywood black was something that may have been um tossed about during the dehumanizer sessions but i i think tony said that he hadn't he really couldn't say for sure whether or not it was because he hadn't heard the Dio song. Maybe if he had heard it, he'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I remember that. Yeah, that was one thing that we were working on. Uh, but he didn't confirm or deny it. Of course, he said, you know, I'm sure the lyrics are probably Ronnie's and maybe they haven't changed. But uh, as far as it actually being a song that was a holdover from Dehumanizer, it's never been really confirmed. But yeah. I, I can kind of hear it. I can kind of hear it. Yeah, maybe. Okay, so uh, side, I believe, was this the first song on side two? I can't remember. Uh, let me see if it shows me. No, I don't know if this is, but this is the fifth song on the record. And this is maybe the point where a little levity might have gone a, a long way here. A wishing well or a slipping away could have could have uh, cleansed the palate a little bit <laughs> here yeah. after after what we've just been uh just been through here but i like this one the title is cool uh i like the ominous sounding bass in it uh so yeah it's it's a cool one again kind of there isn't there's really only one song uh towards the second half of the record that for me rises up to what we've had on the first side so this one kind of occupies the same space as like Hollywood Black for me. It's good. I believe they played Evolution live. I believe they played Hollywood Black live. Good song. Doesn't reach, you know, is, is, isn't isn't a 10 out of 10, but it's, you know, it's a solid 8 out of 10. Yeah, I mean, the first three songs are, are really, maybe arguably the first four songs are pretty much the best of side one evolution uh it is dark and brooding it's a little bit of a filler tune though for me i'm not really drawn to it it's not one that i'm like really looking forward to any particular part of the song it's there and i i enjoy it um because i'm just coming off the strength of the first four songs so i'm sort of like it's sort of winding out side one of the album but it, it's not one that i would typically drop the needle on it's it's a little bit of filler for me so yeah okay next is uh pain uh, again here's this whole <laughs> you know franny just getting right to the point here yeah with the title here it's very like pain <laughs> there it is it's not hidden behind any sort of uh symbolism or or something like that you don't have to look uh too deep okay. into it uh the lyrics are very sort of pessimistic. Give me a choice between pleasure and pain. I choose pain. Uh, the, I like the pummeling, weighty, heavy main riff, the angry, aggressive vocals, the stop-start riff in the verse is pretty cool. Uh, again, yeah, this here's what we talked about in the beginning of the song here. It is it is pretty negative kind of, kind of lyrics here, but this is probably where Ronnie was, you know, at this, at this point. So when you sort of listen back to it and you know, historically what would have been going on, it's maybe lyrics like this. You can kind of see where he was coming from with, with something like this. Yeah. The, the tone is pretty well defined here with pain. There is not a lot of guesswork involved with it. Um, maybe one of the more menacing sounding songs on the album, but Again, similar to Evolution, it, I'm not really drawn to it so much. Maybe I will be at some other point in time because some of these songs have kind of opened up more over the years. And this may be something that I may warm up to. Um, I'm not exactly cold to it, but I'm just sort of a little bit indifferent to it. it it's definitely not a highlight, um, but it, it, it sort of, you know, expands on the theme reinforces the theme i should say that that's throughout the album so and it ends side one and um puts a bow on side one and looking back on what we've just heard i think that uh 
yeah i mean it, it it makes an impression on the listener i mean it's like do we dare turn the record over listen to side two for for fear of what lies in store because man as we got off on a pretty uh pretty pretty dark ride here on side one but um uh, off we go that's interesting two. are you are you looking at the record right now because I'm, on I'm my not, record it has pain as the uh first song on side two but yeah you're right and i mean for me this is sort of one problem i have with this record is that this the later half of this album evolution pain not that they're bad songs but they're just kind of there they're eight eight out of ten seven point five out of ten and there's a little bit of that here on you don't have a lot of songs to there really aren't any songs on this record that I don't like, but there's also only a handful of songs that I think are 10 out of 10 really, really great songs. And then there's a lot of other ones that are kind of seven, eight, eight out of 10 numbers. And unfortunately, Evolution and Pain just kind of feel like that for me. When I first grabbed this record, these aren't the songs that that I'm immediately thinking about and that I am can't wait till the album gets to them. But all right, so no, we'll move. You're, yeah, you're right. Uh, side two, I have the album in my hand now. I I guess I was breaking it up. I had the songs listed here on this uh, on this printout that I'm holding in my hand, but I didn't have the album with me. But yeah, so pain starts off side two. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not, you know, it it, it basically it it continues with the same sort of energy that's from evolution. Um, yeah, and like you said, it it's not a highlight. All right, next is One Foot in the Grave. And this is kind of still along sort of the same vibe to me. I It has a riff at the beginning here, which is about as close to the blues as maybe we get uh, to do the whole record. Although I, maybe I like this one a little bit better than than Pain. Uh, yeah, it's it again, it's a good song. Not as good as some of the stuff on, on side one, but... Uh, It's there. I like it better. Yeah, it, it it's there. I, I do like it better than the uh the previous two songs. Um I'm not really fond of the vocal melody in the beginning, but the song does sort of have an ebb and flow to it that gets makes it more interesting as it moves along, which I think is cool. I always appreciate that kind of organic quality in a song where you know it starts out maybe it's something that doesn't doesn't appeal to you right away but where it moves to it's like oh well that's really cool i didn't see that coming or that's really interesting that's a, that's a really melodic piece that, that's what this song does and, and i appreciate that about it but um you have to kind of for me anyway i i had to kind of stick with it and i was like okay well it's not doing that anything for me right off the bat but overall because of where it goes and how it ends i um uh, i do like it it's um I wouldn't say it's a highlight, but it's definitely a song that I enjoy on the album. And I think that it it makes side two pretty enjoyable, pretty interesting. One of the songs that that does. Um, again, it's another it should be noted that it's another good solo by Tracy G. Um, at this point, you know, we pretty familiar with how he solos and he's not afraid to show that he does have a technical side. He does have a technical aspect to his playing. But what I appreciate about how he plays is that he also does exercise some restraint and does try to, you know, he's a little bit, a little bit of a show off in, in a way, you know, and this is what I could look what I can do, but he also comes, reels it back in and gets it dialed into the, the feeling and the mood of the song and shows some, some, uh, a tasteful quality to his playing. And um, the solo in this song, I think, is also a good example of that. Yeah, I agree. I like his playing on this. And uh, I would probably rank this higher than Evolution and Pain by a little bit. But the next song, uh, Give Her the Gun. Now, this is a deep cut fave of mine, favorite of mine. I believe we did a uh, Sabbath Sunday episode where we did uh, deep cut favorites. And I think uh, this was on my list because I always love this one. I love the feel on this. 
uh, that clean guitar intro. I always love when Ronnie sings in that, in that voice. Uh, and I love the feel in the verse here, like when the drums come in and, uh, please, please don't let him in. You know, the way Ronnie's singing in yeah. those verses. And then he gets really good. Give her the gun, you know, and he gets really, really intense with it. I just think it's great. I think it builds really nice to the choruses. And for me, it's this feel in the verse, that drum beat that, that, that uh, Vinny is playing in the background there is just really, it's real simple, but it's really cool. I say this all the time. Vinny Apice is the king of just, playing a simple drum beat and making it sound really heavy and really cool. And I just, I love his drum sounds, his drum sound on this, on this album. So yeah, I just, I love the way this one builds from the, from the quiet kind of beginning to the way the verses are and that feel that sort of melancholy rolling feel in the verses, but then all of a sudden it gets really big and huge and, and powerful. So yeah, I, I love this one. This is, maybe my second favorite song on this record second or third favorite song this jesus mary and holy ghost and strange highways are the when i think of this album these are my these are the three songs that i think of you know i'm with you this is one of my favorites too um and and i'm, I'm glad you mentioned Vinny because we were kind of talking about dio and 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 tracy g and and i didn't really uh haven't really mentioned how how great Vinny sounds on this whole album but especially like you said on on this song but throughout the album he just his drums are dark but man they are like like he's like martin birch said about how he should approach his playing on on mob rules by throwing boulders he's throwing mountains on this <laughs> song going one yeah. step beyond throwing boulders and throwing some even heavier objects, but <laughs> it integrates so well with 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 most of the songs on the album, if not all of the songs on the album, but especially this. Another thing that I appreciate about this song is, again, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring Tracy G up, um, and 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 all the songs so far, there's there's a very um, most cold, stark aspect to his playing, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It just it is a quality that's that's, that's noticeable. On this, with the acoustic guitar it's more warm and it's a good choice of of style or, or or tone for this song because i think it, this is a song that it's not angry it, i mean it is in, in a way once the song starts to move along but i think what you what they want you to feel is an emotional connection to the subject matter and the subject yeah. matter is something that a lot of bands it's almost almost cliche not to minimize the the point of it of course it's about child abuse um but the way that it's presented here is really effective and it really does pull you into the subject matter emotionally you're not getting this gratuitous this is a psa kind of a vibe from this song where i what where i do from other bands that have, have dabbled with this this seems really sincere and the way it's it's kind of a minimal approach it's, it's laying it out there as far as lyrically and the point of it but it, it's really effective and the way that the music develops the vibe of this song as it pertains to the subject matter is very effective too so we have a really good lyric music match on this song which makes it really effective and it's one of the reasons why i really appreciate this song and also it gives the album a little bit of a little bit of color. And like I said, there this is probably the only time that you can hear some warmth in the guitar tone. And it, it's in the beginning, but then of course it it moves into that yeah. more familiar, angry kind of a vibe. But um I I appreciate that for this song and what, what it pertains to, they kind of change the course a little bit, makes it stand out a bit more from everything that we've heard prior to this so give her the gun is a great song yeah yeah absolutely uh it, it almost reminds me a little bit of too late from uh yeah, from yeah. dehumanizer it has that yeah. that same kind of feel and i agree and again one complaint i have about this record is just that there's a there's just 
maybe not enough variety on here. I mean, Hollywood Black, Evolution, Pain, One Foot in the Grave, they're all kind of a little samey in the in the tempo and the intensity level. So it's 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 kind of nice to go in a different um, it's still intense subject matter, still a lot of emotion here, but it it, it lets you sort of catch your breath here for 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 a second and take you to yeah. to a different place which which I appreciate. Okay, next is Blood from a Stone and this is this is one that you know this album clocks in at uh, just under 60 I think. Yeah, it's like 50 52 minutes 17 seconds. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm looking at I switched over to Dehumanizer. Uh it's somewhere in like the Okay, let me see here. Oh, I don't have the exact time, but I thought it was somewhere in like the 53 minute zone or something like that. Yes, it's 53 minutes. Uh, so they could have afforded to, if there was something to drop from this record, I this is one of them and possibly the song after it too. They could have trimmed this album down to 45 minutes, a little over 40 minutes. And I think it's still, it still would have worked. Again, at this point in the album, it's just this song just kind of sounds too much like it just sounds too samey at this point. It sounds too much like some of the things that have come before it. It just doesn't really jump out of me. Not that it's a bad song, but there's too many other songs that are just kind of like this. So I, this doesn't do a whole lot for me. Yeah. I, but, but I think uh, I, I agree. Yeah. We're getting into uh, with blood from a stone it's sort of not been the album doesn't benefit by it being here but i do think the one noticeable characteristic at least as it occurred to me probably more recently is that it is the one song that i think kind of is a little bit if, if any of them are and, and and practically none of them are but if there has to be one song that's a little bit of a callback to earlier dio of an 80s vibe i think this is about as close as you're going to get I, I do get a um, bit of, of almost, and I'm sure it's completely unintentional, but I think that that Tracy's guitar work is a little bit more straightforward in almost an 80s sounding kind of way that it corresponds with the vibe of the song. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, if you would have asked me probably last year, maybe even you know, a few months ago, I would have said it's completely filler, but recently I, I i this is one of the ones like when i i think i might have been referencing pain um when i said that you know maybe in the future i might really warm up to this song this is an example of a song that i have warmed up to more recently and um and i do like it and, and if it wasn't on the album i i, I would miss it and I, I do look forward to hearing it. it it's not a highlight but i think it's a good addition to the song and i i appreciate it it's funny you mentioned that because I really feel like the last three songs on the record start sounding more eighties. Like, like if we move to the next song, here's to you, this, this, this is probably the strangest yeah. song with yeah. that intro. <laughs> there, here's to you. That sounds like, yeah. so it could have been a doc and, uh, you know, Jeff Pilson here, you know, it could have been some eighties bland thing. And it is more straightforward it's it's like the songs get more straightforward more 80s sounding as we as we wind the record down here uh compared to everything compared to everything else this song here's you have for me has a very hard rock kind of it sounds like it could have been on maybe lock up the wolves or or dream evil uh yep so I guess it's catchy, but it just it, it sticks out in kind of a strange, a strange way. Even though I've been complaining at this point that well, you know, the record could use some different. You could have used a wishing well or, or yeah, you know, uh, well, something like that. You know, something that just has a different a different feel to it. And and I guess that's this song here. But these lyrics kind of don't work. Uh, for me i i don't know it's just it's very weird here's to you here's to me masters of the universe the curse of destiny it's just it's weird it just feels like a song that maybe ronnie had these lyrics sitting around and they didn't they didn't make it on the dream evil so he's he's digging them back back up here it just sort of sticks out in a strange 
way to me, but it is catchy. So I'll give it that. And again, it is different. It's sort of startling when you hear those here's to you vocals at the beginning. You're kind of like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Is this uh is this side two of sacred heart or what, what's going on here? Yeah. And I, yeah, I could see how you, and I, I think I used to think of it that way too. I'm like, what the hell is this song going on? <laughs> what is going on? This is like breaking the whole vibe, but it, it's not really. I, I think what it is, it's like, um, it's, it's the way I interpret this. And and lyrically, when you read the lyrics, you, you, you're you interpreting it in in an in a understandable way. And it, it, it's a probably could be considered a, a more obvious way. But I think when you look into and you try to be a little bit more introspective into what is going on here in this song, I think in the way that it does, and the reason it, it fits in, I think that it fits in with the album is it's like, okay he's like he's saying to the fans okay thanks for coming with me on this journey we're almost it's almost done so here's to you guys here's to you guys that are on my side that are following that followed me here um the resurrection angels the desperation angels there still is a bit of that um isolation that separation from whatever it is that you're you're ra railing against i i think I, the way i interpret the song is that he is like it's it's a tribute it's it's a acknowledgement of the people that okay there's a lot of people that were against me throughout my career even former bandmates and you know whoever but you guys you guys have been with me and you understand and you're listening to this album and you're appreciating this album and you're you're with me on this this ride here this dark heavy menacing plotting ride cold ride but i just want you to know that i'm gonna take a little bit of time out here and let you know that i appreciate you and it still has a little bit of a dark quality to it it's not total like lift your beer in the air let's party down <laughs> it's, it's not quite to that extent that's Thanks. what i think though when i hear that intro i think yeah. it's like a beer here's to you but yeah and that <laughs> you know? for a while that's kind of yeah that's, that's how i took it too but i think i just really started getting into this album definitely more over the past year i, and I think a turning point for me was when we were doing i think it was our do deep cuts and um i got into this album a lot really started really i mean i liked it before that but then when i listened to it prior to doing our our do deep cuts i was like wow this album is fantastic i really really appreciate that and i i started looking at the songs for what i felt they were conceptually that i i i think that there is a conceptual aspect of this album of course it's pretty obvious that it, it you know deals with anger and and it has a cold, hopeless sort of a vibe to it. But I think, you know, I think it was intended to sort of be therapeutic. I think the Dio, maybe it wasn't done yet. There's another album that kind of moves in that in that direction, too. But I think it's more of a from a therapeutic standpoint where, you know, it, it's OK to to dwell on things and, and, and try to work things out, you know, through whatever expression you can. And in Dio's case, obviously, it's music. So, um. I think that's pretty cool and and i think that that's what what's taking place here and i think that here's to you is sort of <laughs> i think he can maybe beating a dead horse here but um here, here's to you is, is i think the rallying cry for a little bit of glimmer of hope like you know if you're understanding where i'm coming from i understand where you're coming from too and we're in this together and i think it's it's a really cool tribute to the fans in a in a, in a way that is somewhat similar to rock and roll children, but it's a little bit more exclusive. Rock and roll children was just out there for all the teenagers in the world or all the, the heavy metal fans or all the hard rock fans that are out there that feel somehow disenfranchised uh, with, with the world around them or whatever situations they're going through. This is a little bit more exclusive. This is a little bit more, hey, you guys are in this club with me. You got this album. You're on this journey with me. This is for us. And that's yeah. how I, that's how I, <laughs> I guess it here as you were talking on just a little research and i guess this is why it makes me think of a beer commercial because apparently anheuser-busch did have a 
campaign uh, in the 80s that was titled Here's to You, America. And yeah. a little trivia for you, Ronnie apparently was in a Budweiser commercial at one point in his career, or at least his voice his voice awesome. was so so there you go a little little deal of trivia for you okay the album closes out on bring down the rain this continues even maybe even more for me in this sort of 80s direction this riff kind of sound main riff kind of sounds to me like something that maybe craig goldie might have played it's got a melodic chorus again this sort of 80s feel to it and again it's not bad but it it just takes it does take the album it is kind of interesting how the album seems to go in in this uh, direction towards the end like it, i can't help but think that maybe uh, you know they got to the end of the record and they, they they needed some extra things here so they started going back through their old co riff cupboard and lyric cupboard and came up with these with these with these last two here but again not a bad song but sort of feels the same to me as as here's to you it's got got that retro feel to it yeah it, it does kind of have a retro feel i like the song a lot i think it's a good tune i think that it should i don't think it should be the last song on the album i think here i think the album should end with here's to you i think that only makes sense i think uh i would i would have flipped it with here's to you and i think it would be or possibly even after give her the gun and then follow bring down the rain with blood from a stone and then and and the album with here's to you so I mean that it, it it's a good song. I it does kind of like take some of the wind out, out of it by having it as, as the last song. I don't feel like this is a, the way that the album should end. So it's kind of like leaves me in sort of a weird place to finish the album where I think I would have felt more completed if it ended with Here's to You. So I think that's the only bad thing about the song. But you're right. It does uh one of the three songs on here that has kind of an 80s vibe and and maybe this is some of the earlier material maybe this was some of the transitional material that yeah. they were working through that ended up where it did on the album i don't know maybe that's something that we could ask tracy if we yeah uh, yeah that would be a good question i'd be curious to hear where these songs came in the writing session if they were things that were at the beginning of the session like i could picture it both ways i could picture these being early songs and it took them a couple songs before they really started finding their, their own sound because these yeah. again feel like they're a little bit like could have been on one of the eighties records, or I could see at the end of the session, they need a couple more songs and Ronnie pulls out an old notebook and he's got a cassette with some riff. He was messing around with right around lock up the wolves or dream evil. And they decide to, to mess around with that and, and go for it. So yeah, that would be, I, that would be interesting to ask Tracy about that. How, how these songs were put together what were the first songs that were done for the record uh, which what were the last songs what were they thinking what were they going for with some of these songs songs like this these last two or three songs for instance that would be very interesting yeah okay uh so got any final thoughts to wrap up strange highways uh no i think we pretty much covered everything i i think that we really uh i think we really uh reinforce that this album has a very dark heavy cold quality to it i mean i don't know how many more many more ways we could express that i would like to give a um put some plugs out here to tracy g um i did i connected with him um online and i asked him some questions so that i would have a little bit of background um before doing this podcast so we, we texted back and forth um and john you, you and i had talked at i i think Dr tracy is open to hopefully doing a, a an interview with us at some point so yeah um, it's something that uh, it's not confirmed yet but it's something that that we're working on that we're hoping we can we can work that out have a chance to talk to tracy and uh interview him and ask him about this album and of course the angry machines and the angry machines record too and it basically his time with with dio in general and what yeah. he's up to these days and some of the other projects that he's had so yeah that's something that we're working on and we're hoping that we'll be able to get together for everybody and that will be its own 
podcast at some point in the future. That's something, you know, a goal with, with, with the podcast that we're, that we're hoping to do as things move along here. And as we get towards the end of the Sabbath catalog, which we're, we're approaching that, that point, uh, we're hoping that maybe we'll be able to get some people that were in the Sabbath world, the Sabbath orbit and uh, interview them. We interviewed uh, Ernie Sifalu, who was involved with the uh, the making of the Sabbath Bloody Sabbath album cover. If you haven't listened to that particular episode, that was a fascinating, uh, great episode. Ernie talking about sitting in the mansion, listening to them rehearsing and stuff like yeah. that. So if you missed that one, definitely go back and check that out. And I think we're going to be doing looking into doing more stuff like that too, for giving everybody some interviews with from, uh, from inside the, the Sabbath world and the, the Sabbath universe. So. But I did transcribe this uh, as interview that, that I did with Tracy and I'm going to post that up on the Facebook page. Um, most of it is stuff that we've already talked about, but um, there, there's some, there's some plugs here, some, some links, tracyg.com. That's Tracy's website. Go ahead and check that out. Um, yeah, has what he's been doing recently. If you're a fan of, of Tracy G, I, like like John and I are, um, there might be uh, something you might be interested in checking out some new music from Tracy. Of course, he's also on Facebook. Um, but I'm going to probably get around to, to putting this up on the uh, the Facebook page. So um, if you aren't already checking us out on Facebook, um, please do so. Um, we usually uh, have a little discussion about the album prior to this going on the air. And it's always interesting to see prior to, to getting into the conversations, what people think about the album. And um, I, I, we have some really uh, great comments and some interesting perspectives on things. And sometimes we don't always, we don't always agree on these records, but it's interesting to, uh, to see uh, everyone's opinion of them and, and I was kind of surprised this one when we posted up about uh, coming that this one was coming soon. I, overall, a really, really positive response, which I was surprised because a, a lot of what I see on on the Internet, people seem to be I think, like you mentioned early on, that this is a sort of a polarizing album, a polarizing era. But the people that uh, commented on the our Facebook page seem to be really, really supportive of this album, which is cool because. Obviously, John and I like it a lot, too. So, yeah, my anyway. final thoughts on this would be if to follow up on what you just said, if this is an album that you sort of missed or maybe it didn't click with you when it originally came out, I would encourage people to go back and and give it another listen, because I think the reason why, like when when we posted something on the Facebook page, we got it up, that we were going to be doing recording this episode, we got a lot of comments. And I th I think it's because we've talked about everybody has talked about last in line and everybody has talked about holy diver and paranoid and things like that and so i think it's fun when you get into these deeper albums these albums that maybe didn't sell as well when they when they came out we're going to be doing cross purposes is going to be our next uh, podcast episode as far as the sequence of the albums that's another album that you now flew under a lot of people's radar at the time but it's become sort of a now, there's a lot of deep cuts on it. People have rediscovered some of these records that maybe that they missed during the 90s. A lot of these albums weren't promoted as well as the 80s stuff was and stuff like that. So a lot of people miss these things. And if you're one of those people that you missed it, you're not sure about this era, didn't like it back then, haven't listened to it in a really long time, I would encourage you to go back and check out uh, this album again because there's a lot of great stuff on it so like darren said uh, please check out the facebook page to stay updated with uh, what we got going on here with into the void and uh there's also uh the uh, youtube channel layer the alchemist darren and i do a sabbath sunday thing we've got a whole back catalog of sabbath sunday episodes where we talk about sabbath and sabbath related topics uh so we love talking Sabbath, lots of ways to talk Sabbath with us. Uh, so make sure you check all those out out there. If uh, we appreciate everybody's support, if you would, your support listening to this podcast, if you would like to support the podcast even more, you can go to co-fi.com, ko-fi.com slash into the void, a black Sabbath podcast, and you can make a donation there. 
in any amount you would like. Uh, thank you to everybody that has already made donations. I'll leave that linked in the uh, description for the podcast if you want to just go directly to it that way. So again, thanks to everybody. We'll see you at the uh, next episode, which is, uh, should be cross purposes. And uh, remember, you can only trust yourself, the 19 Black Sabbath studio albums, and Into the Void, a Black Sabbath podcast.